When I graduated from medical school, as many of you are doing today, a number of things went through my mind, and that was based on the kinds of things I was interested in as I uh, treated patients and was with patients. And the most important thing to me at the time was uh, that a lot of the things that I really liked in the uh, patients' diseases were immunologic, apparently immunologic problems. And these were, pa these were patients that had glomerulonephritis or rheumatic fever, or multiple sclerosis. And I thought if I could get the basic background in immunology that uh, I thought these patients suffered from, I would uh, be in a much better position to uh, be with them in the future. So I went around uh, the country and the United States looking for places where immunology was being done uh, as the basic science and from Boston to New York to out to the West Coast and found one actually at the University of Pittsburgh in which there was a group of young people uh, doing immunology. And the average age of the department was 29, which I thought was remarkable. So I took myself off to Pittsburgh and uh, got involved in laboratory research there. Um, we uh, talked a lot with each other about the things we were doing, and as immunology progressed, uh, so did we. Uh, we gave papers in the various institutions uh, and uh, at various national meetings, and things were going fine. But then the university changed its president, and a new bureaucracy came in and the bureaucrats in the uh, university told us that, for example, that if we wanted to travel to meetings, for which we brought our own money in to do, um, we would have to pass that through an administrative approval in order to be able to go to the meeting. So after a, a bunch of this bureaucracy built up, we decided to change institutions, and a group of five of us went out to the West Coast and started the Scripps Research Institute. And this was at exactly the same time as uh, Jonas Salk went out, having found the vaccine for polio, and started the Salk Institute. And the University of California in San Diego uh, was de developing its first medical school. And five of us from each of the institutions, the, the only five in the institutions at the time, would meet and talk about the fun we had doing research. And it was just marvelous occasions. Through the years at our institute, the Scripps Research Institute, uh, we had lab our own laboratories. We brought in our own money, the, uh, our own salaries we would bring in with uh, grants from the National Institutes of Health so that the, in the institution had no rights to our time, and that meant that solely research was the important thing in our lives. Uh, there were five of us, and we had seven postdoctoral fellows, and uh, we published some papers. And after f the 50 years, and we just celebrated the 50th year, uh, there were 300 staff people and uh, 1,200 postdoctoral fellows. Uh, we publish about 1,500 uh, papers a year. Um, and of interest, uh, about 5,000 postdoctoral fellows have gone out into the world, uh, having finished their time at uh, two to three to four years at Scripps, and they're now uh, in uh, research positions in medical centers and research centers uh, from Tokyo to Moscow, all the way across the, the world. Um, one thing always that we had in mind was being innovative, getting new ideas and thinking new thoughts. And I would give you an example of one of these that came along uh, in 1988. And uh, a young fellow came over from the Department of Neonatology at the University of California, and I can still see him sitting across my desk looking at me and saying that he dealt with surfactant and they understood uh, the phospholipid composition, but they knew there were proteins involved and these proteins were important and asked if I would help him uh, with the proteins, because we did a lot of uh, protein work at the time. And this was Alan Merritt, who is now on the staff here at Poznan and gives lectures for over a month here each year, and his son Travis is in the second year of medical school here. So this is a story that's uh, close to my heart and I'm sure close to yours as well. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, uh, Alan got us some surfactant, human surfactant, and uh, we began separating it on uh, columns, which was in an aqueous buffer. And the first thing that caught my attention was that there was a precipitation at the top of this aqueous column. 
So I got the precipitate out and uh, dissolved it in, uh, in uh, uh, organic solvent since it wasn't soluble in water. And sure enough, it was uh, soluble in organic solvents. And this is the first protein known in biology to be uh, soluble and to be active in, in non-aqueous medium. It's the only one today that is. So I got that protein and uh, got some sequence and got the cDNA for it and then <coughs> predicted its sequence and it, sure enough it was full of hydrophobic amino acids with occasional positively charged amino acids spread out through the uh, sequence of the protein. And I made peptides of that because that was what we usually did in uh, dealing with proteins to find out what part of the protein is involved in its activity and found that the, uh, each of the peptides that contained uh, one or two uh, positively charged amino acids uh, was positive when mixed back with phospholipids and tested for surfactant activity. And that meant, again, something unique, and that is that the sequence of amino acids in that protein, as governed by the DNA, were not important. And I thought, well, why not take a peptide made of just leucines, which were hydrophobic, and then have intermittent lysines, which were positively charged, and so synthesize peptides made of that formulation and put them back with phospholipids and tested them in preterm uh, fetal rabbits, and it worked like a charm, just as good as, as mixing the whole surfactant protein B protein back with the... Uh, with phospholipids, and it acted just, and it functioned just as well as whole surfactant did. So this meant, that, again, that there was a synthetic peptide that was as good as the whole protein and could be used to, uh, uh, to uh, treat patients. Um, and uh, that was something that uh, caught my attention to the point that I stopped all the other work in the lab and turned it over to my associates and then focused strictly on this. It worked in the uh, preterm rabbits, and so we then went up to a primate center at the University of California, Davis, and put it into a cesarean-delivered preterm rhesus monkeys, and it worked beautifully in them and would bring their, uh, expand their lungs very quickly and bring them back to a normal state. And thereafter, we went into a, a clinical trial in five, in human beings, in five academic centers in the country, it worked well in that, and then it was a matter of ha uh, going through the Food and Drug Administration to finish the final phase of trials, the phase three trials. And this was done in Europe and up and down the Americas. And in Europe, there was a person who ran these trials in Eastern Europe and did a fantastic job, and that was Jan Mazella, who is on your faculty here in Poznan and uh, just a marvelous person. He's also invented new things himself, uh, one of uh, which is a plastic device called Affect Air, which will guide aerosolized surfactant into the trachea of human beings at a much higher concentration than has ever been achieved before, and that will play a very important role in the future development of the surfactant. And so uh, it has gone uh, into these uh, uh, in, in through the phase three trial, it then is most recently, as of March 6, been approved by the American Food and Drug Administration, and uh, will go out into the world. It will also not be just for preterm infants. It will also be for patients that have uh, acute asthma and COPD. It can be used in patients with cystic fibrosis who can't get the uh, dry plaques out of their tracheas. It, uh, it will. Uh, it will work well with that, and uh, so we're in, in great hopes that this uh, surfactant, this kale 4 surfactant, will play an important role in saving lives and improving health of people in this world. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the kale 4 peptide came by a distillation of the surfactant protein B, the unique protein that's essential uh, for the surfactant activity. And as I mentioned also, I tried a whole number of different kinds of amino acid sequences to uh, bring about this function and distilled it down as far as it could be into the kale 4 peptide. And I think uh, since peptoids made, of or made uh, by organic synthesis are not quite as good as the kale 4 peptide, 
that if we come back in a million years, we'll still see the kale 4 peptide being used uh, with, the sur with the phospholipids as a surfactant to treat the multiple human diseases, and that'll make certainly me feel really good. And finally, I would <coughs> I have a message to deliver to you as you graduate, and that is that f the, the first message is to always think of innovations that you can produce. Do not go to work just to accomplish that day's uh, routine at, uh, at your work, but go with the idea of looking for something new and different, something creative that will change the world and improve it. Just be sure you do that. And the second thing is, when you look back at your history in medical school, don't worry about where you stood academically. It's not important where you stood in your class and how good your grades were. And I say that because there have been a number of studies to indicate that the innovative qualities in a human being are not necessarily linked to their academic performance. And in fact, in a very good study that was done on 753 high-achieving people in the United States, these are some of the highest achievers that this author could find, and then bet, went back with their permission to find where they stood in their classes academically, that half of them stood with a C or lower academic grade, and half of them stood with a B or higher, meaning that it made no difference where you stood in your class, really, to, uh, academically, in order to be a high-achieving, innovative individual. And I urge you to go out into this world uh, not worrying about where you stood in your academic class, but thinking very much about new items that you can deliver innovatively to improve the world. And I wish you all the best of luck in that.